All right. Am I on? Great. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Tableau Conference. Everyone having a good time so far? Woo! I love it. All right. Well, welcome to today's session. Uh, we'll start with some intros here. My name is Madeline Corneli. I'm a product manager at Tableau. I work on our technology partners team. So I work with all of the technology that you use that interacts with Tableau. And one of the most common and ubiquitous pieces of technology is the cloud. And especially recently, we've seen a huge growth in number of Tableau customers using Azure as their platform of choice. So that's me. Um, but I also want to introduce uh, my friend Chris Bullock here, who's going to join us. And I want to start with a story. So about uh, Chris and I actually started working at Tableau on the very same day. This was about four and a half years ago. Um, we train together in Seattle. He works out of the DC office, um, and I work out of the Seattle office. But we stayed in touch after training, um, mostly due to Chris. He uh, helped me out a bunch. This is one of my first gigs after college. Um, Chris has had a couple more. but um, <laughs> uh, So we kept in touch. And then about two years ago, Chris flew out to Seattle for a work trip. And he scheduled some time with me. And he said, Madeline, I, I found this cool thing that I, I want to show to you. Um, and I was like, all right, sign me up. I'm always down for, for learning about new stuff. Um, now, Chris brings passion and excitement to everything that he does, which is amazing. Um, and this was no exception. So we sat down, and Chris decided to show me about this cloud thing. Um, and he showed me how to spin up a virtual machine in about five minutes. And then we installed Tableau Server on it. And it only took about five minutes for me to realize that this was really cool stuff. Uh, and that a lot could be done with this. And I just was kind of astounded by the opportunity there. And that was all thanks to Chris. Um, so I know firsthand uh, how exciting it is to be shown uh, the possibilities of the cloud. Fast forward two years to now, uh, Chris actually runs our entire pre-sales-based cloud champions team. So that's a collection of all of the smartest, most cloud-savvy people at Tableau. Um, so like I said, I know firsthand what it's like to go on this journey with Chris. And now you guys are going to experience it as well. So let's bring Chris up here and get started. Can you <laughs> Thank you, Madeline. Um, I'm going to say a word about Madeline briefly. Um, as we know, leadership can take different forms. There's leaders that can inspire us. There's leaders that are good at operational excellence and different kinds of things that we all respond to and we all need, right? We need different kinds of personalities. But there's one trait that the best leaders have. Any guesses as to what that is? Well, that's up there. It's not what I had. So how about the second best one? <laughs> uh, courage. Courage. The courage to do the right thing in the moment, the courage to ask the right questions, the courage to take on the reality of the situation. Uh, when we did on board, I'm going to say on behalf of uh, Madeline, she's full of courage. We learned that right away. The first thing I knew about Madeline was she's full of courage. And that's about all I needed to know to say, Let's explore some collaboration. And here we are. So it's great to be here. So we are part of the Tableau family. We're glad you're part of the Tableau family. We're glad you're here. We hope you had some good lunch. And as you see, we ordered some extra space today so you could all just kind of lie down across four seats <laughs> and have that, you know, make that after lunch spot count. Let's take a look at what we're going to talk about today. Um, first, Tableau on Azure, why it makes sense, OK? Uh, second, we'll take a look at the general data environment in Azure. Third, a pattern for enterprise deployment. What, they, what I mean by pattern is an architectural pattern. We want to look at how do we want to think about deploying Azure Tableau Server in Azure. I almost said Azure Server in Tableau. You know what I mean. Um, then we're going to look at identity and access management, cover a few concepts around that. And then planning for operational success, just some other nuances to help you succeed. Sound good? All right, let's jump in this. Uh, ta Tableau on Azure, why it makes sense. Um, as you heard in the keynote this morning, wasn't that great, by the way? The keynote was really, really good. I liked that they focused on Tableau Public because I love Tableau Public. Anytime I want to learn uh, about a topic or what people do in Tableau, I'm, guess what, guys? My job partly is to demo Tableau. But you know what? I go to Tableau Public because I like to see the ideas and the enthusiasm of a community that embraced Tableau, made it their own, and helped us become a leading um, self-service analytics solution. So um, you won't find that with another product. Not like that. And that's, that's one thing that I really appreciate. 
So, Tableau culture. I have a question. Let's take the Tableau culture into our Tableau and Azure world. Who here today is evaluating Azure? Fair enough, good. Uh, who has already deployed Tableau in Azure? Oh, yes. I like the experience in the room. How about, how about small to mid-sized organizations? Okay, very good. We got a pretty good distribution here. And then, guess what? Larger enterprises. Nice, okay. And how about using multiple public clouds? We're in Azure, but not exclusively in Azure. Okay, okay. Now that's different from average. Average is 50 to 60%. Note that, okay? Or has Azure-centric data gravity? Like, the data's in Azure, we're deploying in Azure. Ooh, a lot fewer than I might have imagined. Okay, good. So, couple things. Tableau value on public clouds. Tableau offers Gartner leading TCO. You already probably knew that. Azure uh, and data options, and then enterprise deployment options. We have a special announcement at the end of the presentation today. Uh, the next section here is the data environment section, and we'll have Madeline show us about that. All right. So a key part of planning your Tableau deployment uh, and the Tableau journey itself is understanding your data environment. You may have existing data services that you've already invested in. You may be planning to migrate your data. Um, you might be investing in an entirely new data platform. Um, there's lots of different stages that you could be in, and this is typically always changing for organizations. But whatever stage you're in, Tableau can meet you there. So let's take a look at what a realistic um, data environment might look like. And, and Mature data environments tend to have a lot of moving pieces in them, lots of different services that are designed to accomplish various goals. So first off here is where the data is actually coming from. More and more systems these days are generating large volumes of data at high velocity, this trend towards big data that we see. So things like Internet of Things, streaming data, machine learning generated stuff, log files, right? There's more and more data being created by lots of different systems. And this is, of course, in addition to files that people create and edit every day such as Excel and CSV files. Typically, this data goes some, through some sort of cleaning or organizational process. A lot of this can be accomplished, accomplished in Azure, but often people are using various different types of data storage and data transformation solutions. And at the end of this system, or as a part of this holistic system, we want to land that data in Tableau. We want to give our users access to that data so they can get fast answers to their questions. And so a lot of this planning goes into making that final user experience of actually querying and interacting with your data as good as possible. There's something we say in Tableau, which is um, your dashboard or your Tableau viz is only going to be as fast as your data is. So it's important that we consider the entire platform that we're creating for our users, starting with that data. And of course, from Tableau, we have over 80 native connectors. Um, and we're announcing new ones very, very quickly. Uh, and we're also expanding out a platform that allows partners and customers to build their own connectors. So connectivity is key here. And for a Microsoft or Azure um, customer here, we have lots of different options for connecting directly to that data. So of course, SQL Server is one of our most popular connections um, from Tableau, but also Excel and Access. So you're gonna get your sort of quintessential Microsoft-based service connectors there. And then we also have connectors to lots of your data in the Azure stack. So Azure DB, which is SQL Server on the cloud, Azure SQL Data Warehouse, HD Insight, and several more. This is in addition to our cloud and on-premise data sources as a whole. So as Chris mentioned, um, we're seeing a large growth of customers deploying uh, in multi-cloud scenarios. Um, sounds like not that many here today, but given the trend, it might be in the future, you may need to connect to something that isn't in Azure in addition, potentially, to your Azure connections. And that's where those other uh, 75 connectors come in handy. And finally, it's important to keep in mind Prep Conductor, which is a great tool that we've um, released and have been iterating on. So when we talk about transforming your data, you can actually do that using the Tableau platform and using Prep Builder and Conductor to create and automate workflows that transform your data and make it better for analysis. So with all of that in mind, we can keep, uh, keep our eye on our data as we focus in on how to actually deploy Tableau Server on Azure, which we'll give back to Chris. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madeline. 
All right, pattern for enterprise deployment. Now we're gonna get into the good stuff, okay? You ready for some um, how we do it? All right, so what we all want when we use Tableau is that good, responsive self-service or information, but to get that, we have to have some help. We have to have some things right on the back end, don't we? We have to have some good planning. We have to have some good connectivity. We have to have good architecture. So to level set, I want to make sure we all understand this about architecture. Ready? Architecture is, oh, no, it's not BS. But guys, seriously, isn't there, aren't there times when you hear architecture and you go, ah, oh, whatever, right? Because it doesn't really have a definition yet. We'll give it one. Uh, I had a good conversation years ago with a really good technologist, someone I really look up to. We were talking about technology and architecture, and he said this, and I always remembered it, partly because he's funny, and two, because it's kind of true. We all say, if this goes in a bureaucratic direction or whatever, it seems good, and then it goes off a cliff. So why don't we put some uh, precision to what we mean today when we talk about architecture. So when we say architecture, we mean describing the deployment with an emphasis on non-functional requirements, okay? Security, scalability, connectivity, sustainability. Part two, to produce reusable solutions or reference architectures. Now, why would we do that? So you can focus on your organization's business, okay? We know that what we discussed today will get you down the road to your organization's particular implementation needs. But what we want to do is enable you to get that far down the road so you can. Okay, that's what we're going to focus on today. So let's get started. Um, we're going to start with this Azure region. What I thought I'd do is make that font so small that you could never see it, okay? But it says Azure region in there. So let's start uh, making a decision about when we move to the cloud and how many of you right now maybe are doing migrations for the first time or, or looking at doing it. Okay, so these are, this is a good place to start. Let's start and think about how do we even get organized in Azure, okay? So you wanna have an Azure account and subscription set up for this deployment. Uh, the hierarchy in Azure is account, and within account are subscriptions, think cost center, stuff's gonna build to those subscriptions, and then resource groups. Within subscriptions, you can place your resources for a project or related projects into a resource group or resource groups that then tie to subscriptions cost center, so to speak, okay? So that's how you get organized. Now, one cool thing that I love about resource groups is for the most part, you can, you can script what's in there, okay? You can save off a resource group and move it somewhere else. Um, maybe not the entire implementation, but a pattern of it, okay? So, um, now, the other thing you want to ask, you want to ask some questions. What region do I want to deploy in? Obviously, uh, here we are west. We say we have data west. We want to think about putting our stuff, our Tableau server cluster in west. But there's some other reasons to cross-check what region you want to go into. One is, um, does it have the services I need? So we're going to introduce today, it came out within the past two weeks, the Bastion service, okay? I highly recommend the Bastion service. We'll talk about that in a few minutes, but it's not in every region yet. Now, you may not care, but the point here is to say, survey the region you wanna be in and know what services are available to that region. You with me? Music coming out of the speakers. <laughs> I kinda liked it, but all right. You want to just hear my voice? Okay. So um, we're going to build our first VNet. Now the VNet is, you might also hear in the other public clouds, VPC, Virtual Public Cloud. In Azure, we call it VNet. Uh, we're going to build our first VNet, okay? And we're going to start putting some things in there. Now we're going to look at a couple different architectural patterns that we want to level set together as we proceed, okay? So the first, do we want to deploy single or multiple VNets, and why, okay? Um, when you look at Azure's DMZ architecture page, how many of you have looked at that page recently? Okay, uh, it was a certain way until about two weeks ago, and then it changed to a new way, and uh, we will help you with the new way, okay? Uh, but there's a couple things um, there. 
Customers are moving to a hub and spoke architectures. Blah, 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 what does that mean? Let's take a look at the DMZ pattern in general. Let's say you're on-prem and you have, this, is, this picture is something we live in every day but we don't think about too much. So notice you have represented on the left the internet, you've got a firewall, and on the other side you've got represented LAN and a firewall. So the LAN represents your backend systems your organization's systems that do not have direct access to the internet, and you don't want them to. Um, meanwhile, you got the internet, you don't want it to have access to your backend systems. Now, the DMZ is where everything comes together. It's a public subnet of your network on-prem that allows internet to come to you, but only if you want it to back to the backend, and likewise from the backend out to the internet, okay? Now, this is the pattern that as folks have adopted public cloud over the last several years, remember like five, six years ago when uh, surveys said, hey, no, we're not moving to the cloud, it's not secure, we're not doing that, no way. And then people realized people can steal stuff on-prem too and said, okay, we'll go to the cloud. So, um, and it happened pretty fast. It was between 2015 and 2016, okay? So take, take this idea this DMZ idea, internet, DMZ, and LAN, and let's move it to the cloud, and it's gonna adjust slightly. It looks like this, okay? So to the left we have on-prem and internet outside of the cloud. The virtual network is your network in the cloud, your VNet. You've got a public and private subnet, okay? It's the same idea as your on-prem pattern we just looked at. You've got the back end, the LAN is still private, Unless it goes through the public area, nothing touches it, okay? Same from the internet in. Now, here's what happened. Back when people decided, okay, I'm gonna put my stuff in the cloud, here's what happened. They saw this pattern, and for every application they wanted to deploy, they made that pattern in the cloud. So you had a public-private subnet for application one, another one for two, another one for three, and so forth. And what happened is, you got stuff all over the place. Now what, do you, what happens when you want to change your networking strategy or rules? You have a mess, okay? So this is where the hub and spoke model has emerged as a, a model that helps us govern what's going on. So in this model, those applications still can be deployed in their own VNets. They can still be deployed in public and private subnets, but we, we're going to use a central or hub, firewall area to govern all of the rules, or as many as we can, in the application areas or the spokes, so that we can centrally manage things. Okay, does that make sense? So with those concepts in mind, we're gonna start building out our Tableau cluster, okay? So we have our VNet, our spoke. We have a um, little tiny font for you to try to read. Uh, that represents a way that we're going to put a device in the public subnet to go back into the private subnet and build our stuff, our virtual machines, okay? Now, traditionally, we have a jump box or a bastion host. You familiar with that term? Um, pardon? Yes, the jump server. So at this point, that box represents the jump server and it's gonna be in a public subnet. Now, I had to do this, guys, so, yep, that's me in the 80s, uh, hair and all. I have the wig still. I lost the pants, no, I don't know. <laughs> so, the jump box, we might as well jump, uh, traditional way to access workloads in um, VMs, and we've used this many times in multiple clouds. Now, the idea is you deploy a small VM in the public subnet, you go to that VM using remote desktop, and then from that VM, you go and, and install Tableau Server on the private VMs. That's been the pattern. Now, like a lot of these repeatable processes in the public cloud, Azure gave us a gift a couple weeks ago. They gave us the Bastion service, which means you no longer have to deploy that box if you have Bastion in your region, you can use the new Bastion service. So the real joke about this page is, you might as well Bastion, to be honest, okay? So um, you have that choice though. So in the architecture, we wanna acknowledge both. 
So far, so good? Okay. So you have the bastion or the uh, jump box. That will take us back to the workload subnet, now represented in our architecture here. And that's where, that is the private subnet. Um, management is the public subnet. Others will emerge in the public area, and we're going to see that shortly. So we're going to start to build out our cluster in the private subnet, okay? Um, the first Tableau node, when you build that VM and you go into your Bastion service or your jump box, you can RDP to that node. By the way, Bastion service, here's what's cool about it. If you Bastion in, if you go to jump box, you RDP to the jump box, then you RDP to your backend server. If you use the Bastion service, it pops it open in your browser page and you're just right there. It's just easier, it's cleaner, and it's always there. And it can scale to however many VMs you need. Kind of an easy decision, I think. So now once you start building that, uh, once you start installing Tableau, that first install, guess what? It's a very normal vanilla Tableau installation. It's just like you're going to install it on your on-prem box. Okay, So you're going to walk through Tableau's guidance. You're going to set up your first server. And then just, uh, just as on-prem as well, you're going to add, in this case, guys, I'm setting up a, a cluster of three for an example, OK? Um, and we're going to use the, the uh, TSM and the configuration bootstrap file. For those of you who haven't installed, what this is is a file that you go and use to install the nodes, and it does the, does the magic for you, OK? So that's what we're going to do. And I'm going to slow down a little bit and take a look. So now we have our three, our set of three uh, VMs in the workload subnet or the private subnet. Now, in the central column and, and everywhere left of that, we're assuming that's your public subnet. So you see that the bastion creates its own subnet. And you're going to see this pattern. We're going to put a load balancer on those three uh, nodes, and if you use a standard load balancer, great. If you use the free one, great, but it won't encrypt it. You probably want it encrypted, then you start paying for it. Um, or you can use the application gateway, okay? Those are two different load balancers. Um, the standard is a OSI level four. Uh, application gateway is OSI level seven. The difference is the level four one takes IP addresses and routes them around. The application one can think more about it. What's happening here? Maybe I distribute according to certain rules. And it has other provisions like a web, uh, web application firewall to help govern traffic coming into your cluster. OK? Now, there's one thing I haven't mentioned yet. High availability. How many of you are thinking high availability as you go to the cloud, right? So there's a couple approaches we can use here. You're going to see that each of these nodes is placed in a different availability zone. For terminology, who knows availability zone? What's that? It's a data center, basically. So a region is made up of a set of data centers or availability zones. It puts a node in separate data centers. Now, I know you can't tell, but I've been around a little while. And my historical sensibilities tell me you don't want to put your nodes too far apart from each other, right? That's kind of ludicrous ludicrous. So that's why we're doing it, because it's ludicrous. But why, why does that make sense? Yes, sir. Preach it. Yeah. That's right. So what, that's right, great answer. So what happens is, once you're in the cloud, and you can make use of different resources and sort of repurpose how we do high availability. If you take a cluster and stripe it across multiple data centers, whether you, use, you lose a node or you lose the data center, God forbid, right? Just remind me to get out of there before it happens. But um, the cluster to the cluster, it's the same thing. And that's part of the high availability strategy. That's one of two. We'll talk about another one in a few minutes, OK? So that's what that's about. You take a node, place it in different availability zones. Then one other thing about the region check. Remember when I said check your region and so forth? Yes, sir.
Yeah, we have. Yeah, we have. Um, we have patterns published for three years that we do. Let's talk. Let's talk after the session. But yeah, this is a best practice, and it's going to be about. I'll tell you what. The, there's a catch there, though, and it ties back to my historical sensibilities. When you're in the cloud, the networking is really good. So the fact that they're not right next to each other, but you have to have certain rules in place, and that's where things get funny. So, okay. Um, let's keep moving. So you got your load balancing. You can do application gateway. You can do um, a standard load balancer. Okay, so far so good? Uh, we went through some of these. The third one there is Traffic Manager. That is not really a load balancer in the classic sense that you would use with Tableau, probably, but it's more of a global DNS router. If you got this happening here, globally route it here, and that probably will tie to another load balancer uh, working together for that. There's one last piece here, and this is something that we want to both introduce and reinforce today. On the leftmost side, you're going to see the Azure Firewall. How many of you have seen Azure Firewall? How many of you are using Azure Firewall with Tableau? Okay, that's what we're gonna talk about here. Okay, um, there's a couple things I want you to notice on this slide here. Um, notice that there's two VNets, okay? Uh, when you look on Microsoft's DMZ page, you're gonna see one VNet that contains the firewall subnet, the application gateway subnet, and then what we will abstract as the workload subnet here. Or you can use multiple VNets. Why would you use multiple VNets in, instead of bundling it all into one? Okay, it goes back to the hub and spoke. The idea here is if you approach this with a pattern of putting the firewall in its own VNet, putting Tableau in its own VNet, then you can add application two, application three, application four, and use the same Azure Firewall, okay? That's the idea. Now, how many of you saw Microsoft's DMZ pictures until about two weeks ago? There were network rules all over the place, NVAs, okay? Um, network virtual appliances appliances that helped govern what's going on in your Azure environment, often third party, okay? So let's hone in on the, the firewall a moment. What the heck is that firewall, okay? So it's Azure's next generation firewall service. The idea is you deploy it as a hub, you manage the rest of your applications, okay? Um, it's positioned for hybrid DMZ architectures, hybrid meaning your on-prem extended into Azure, okay? Um, it can be used with other NVAs, read network devices that you can use in tandem together with firewall depending on your network requirements. So in a nutshell, let's return to this momentarily. Here's a couple things that are happening. Your Tableau inbound communication uh, is gonna come through the application gateway, HTTP and HTTPS. It's gonna come through application gateway. You can use the web application firewall with it. It'll go back to the Tableau uh, work, workload subnet, do the work, bring it back to you. The firewall is helping those nodes talk out to the internet. Uh, if you're familiar with other cloud providers, you're gonna hear NAT gateway. Okay, so in this architecture, the firewall is pro providing what we know as the NAT gateway, okay? All right, now the fun stuff. Madeline, <laughs> you can wake everybody up now. Yeah, we'll take a, a quick detour here and talk a little bit about identity and access management, everyone's favorite topic. Um, but an important element of deploying your Tableau server is secu securing user access. Um, so we wanna control who can get into our server uh, and who has access to data and content in that Tableau server deployment. But we also want the system to be seamless and not impede the user experience. And accomplishing both of these tasks means you have to do some planning beforehand. So how does Tableau Server think about security and access management? We think about it in three different ways. Authentication, authorization, and row level security. Authentication is who are you? 
are you allowed to come in to Tableau Server? Authorization is what you're allowed to do <coughs> excuse me, in Tableau Server. And finally, role level security is what data you're allowed to see. I'm going to take some water real quick. what happens when you present all day. And finally, row level security, what data you're allowed to see once you're actually in your Tableau server. Now, authorization and row level security happen in Tableau server itself. You're actually going to set those up using the UI. And so what we want to focus on is that authentication piece. That's what happens first when someone comes in from the outside and tries to access your Tableau server. To manage authentication, you need to have, consider two main pieces. The first is the identity store. This is your address book. This is where you write down who everyone is and what groups they're part of and what you want them to be allowed to do. Then you have the authentication mechanism. So this is the actual tool that Tableau Server uses to communicate with the identity store. <coughs> so when we're talking about an identity store, uh, especially when we're talking about identity store in relation to Tableau Server on Azure, there are going to be some key things that come up. The first is Active Directory. This is probably something that a lot of you are familiar with. Who's actually using Active Directory today? Shocker. OK. Um, so this is going to be probably your enterprise standard when it comes to identity and access management. So if you're using Active Directory, uh, we're going to talk about how you can use that as your identity store. And we're also going to talk about what it means to use Azure Active Directory. So Azure Active Directory is uh, Active Directory, but it's hosted as a SaaS service. So you're basically going to take your Active Directory, and it's what it looks like if it's on Azure. So instead of you actually have to, having to host it locally, it's provided as a service for you. So if you're using Azure Active Directory and you're deploying Tableau Server on Azure, that's going to be probably the easiest for you. They both live in the cloud. They both live in Azure. And you can see a, as this picture where they're just going to talk directly to each other. So you can set up Azure ID as your identity store. You can also use a service called Azure ID Domain Services. This is going to give you a little extra control over how you sync um, your identity store and how that identi identity store communicates with your Azure workload. But what if you're using Active Directory on-premise? So we can also support that. You're going to use a service called Azure AD Connect. And this is going to allow you to sync your on-premise Active Directory tenant with your Azure Active Directory. So we have lots of different options here we can accommodate for whatever type of scenario you're using, whether you're going to stick with your current on-premise Active Directory tenant, if you want to sync that with Azure Active Directory, or potentially migrate that to Azure Active Directory entirely. So the next step on top of this is we've made, we've made considerations for um, identity and access management, figuring out which protocol we want to use to authenticate and which identity store we want to use. There are a couple other considerations that we have when it comes to actually planning for operational success. So some of the other stuff that happens outside of your Tableau server that you need to think about to make sure everything's going to work together. Let's hand it back to Chris for that. Thank you, Madeline. All right, so planning for operational success. We all want to succeed, don't we? Um, so virtual machine options. Um, this is a good place to take a little bit and focus and think about what you want for your organization. Uh, we have done uh, some testing in the public cloud using TabJolt. Um, the short story here is that for best bang for the buck, okay, our, our, gener our compute optimized and general purpose options are the best options for best bang for the buck in general for our test set. Um, one of the luxuries of the cloud is you can try it before you buy it. You can spin up a server, you can spin up Tableau, hook up to your data um, sources, and do some testing. See if it works for you before you invest in um, maybe a long-term investment in a particular machine type, okay? Uh, so try it out. Uh, we've done that with great success. We can point you to a white paper that will help you do that. Um, so think about your virtual machine options, okay? Now, remember we talked about high availability options, and we talked about striping your nodes across data centers. What happens if you don't have three data centers in a region? You get availability sets, okay? Um, now, 
Azure has matured to the point where I think most regions you look at will have at least three data centers, okay? But over time, that wasn't always the case as any public cloud matures. And so Microsoft offered an uh, SLA of 99.95 on availability sets and, and simply within a data center, it's where they replicate loads across different racks. And by that, and by that approach, being able to preserve if a rack goes down, for example. Okay, does that make sense? So when you look at Microsoft's high availability literature and you see availability sets, that's what that is. If you look at their literature more recently as the regions have matured into three or more data centers, you see the strategy going back to the availability zone approach that we use, okay? So just wanna clarify that as you're doing your homework, you'll see both. Could you use both? Sure. Um, but as a core architecture pattern, we like striping across the data centers for the reasons we talked about, okay? All right, cost management. I always like to try to hand this one to Madeline because Madeline has written some really good uh, Tableau um, products and just solutions around cost management. But cost management can be captured in Azure just like the other public clouds. You can use Tableau to see where your costs are going, where your spending's going, and so forth. Um, note that Madeline has also put together uh, a Linux quick start for Azure. Um, if you're going to use Linux, uh, this is a script that will uh, deploy uh, Tableau for you and has gone ahead and, and uh, published that. Okay. Um, next steps. Now here's the punchline, guys. We have something for you today. I know we covered a lot of stuff, right? And you're like, wow, that's just like too much. How are you supposed to remember all that? You don't have to remember all that because as of yesterday, Madeline and I have published a white paper that describes the architecture, describes the options we discussed, and maps out steps end to end for the architecture we just talked about, okay? This is available publicly, just Google it um, and you'll find it. Next generation Cloud BI Tableau server hosted on Microsoft Azure, okay? At this point, we've covered our content, and I wanted to give you guys a chance to do some Q&A, and we're happy to help you, and if I don't know the answer, I'll toss it over to Madeline, and she'll be happy to answer it. <laughs> so, questions? Yes, sir. I'm sorry, come again? That's a good question. I would probably, yeah. Uh, yes, the question is where in the architecture would you deploy a service to host Tableau extensions? You probably want to host it where it serves your business. It might be in the private subnet, it might be in the public, depending on what it's accessing. I mean, I don't know the answer, but that's how I would think about the answer. Yes, sir. Azure AD Tableau server. SAML. There's documentation for connecting it to them. If you want to sync the identi identity store, um, that you have to script out. So that's a manual process currently. Yeah. So we're looking at, yeah, so currently there, the difference is Active Directory is like an official identity, supported identity store for Tableau Server. Um, and the question is, sorry, the question is how do you sync um, Azure Active Directory as your identity store for Tableau Server? Um, and currently only Active Directory is an officially supported one. And so for Azure Active Directory, you have to go through some manual steps, um, unfortunately. So that's the current state. Future state is we do want to get it to a point where Azure Active Directory is at the same level as Active Directory. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, at this point, I personally don't, but there's a twist to that because some of the VMs assume like a one-to-one -one core and some are two-to-one, so there's some work to be done on that front. I would acknowledge that. Yep, that's a good question. Yes, yes, sir. Ah, so disaster recovery. 
It's going to follow, yes, or is that related or? Okay, uh, it's gonna, at that point, it's gonna follow the patterns for DR uh, for Azure, and they've already got like region to region matchups and um, patterns for backup and recovery. We would fit into those patterns, okay? Yes, sir. Uh, don't have a firm timeline on it yet, but that is the next one that we're planning to add. And and kind of the obvious is it's market driven. So if the market's moving there and saying, guys, can you do this? That moves up the priority list. Yeah. So, okay. Yes, sir. No, not yet. Now, just, just for FYI in general, that is a fundamentally changing thing in our whole product line. I don't have a date or a promise, but I can tell you that we get it and we're acting on it. Okay, good question. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's, that's, again, one of those things that we don't have currently but is on the roadmap is, is offering, like, the expanded um, support for our... Yeah, and, and I, I've heard this, this complaint before. This, so we're aware that this is a gap um, that's going to be coming. Um, come up and talk to me afterwards and we can... Yep. Yeah, and and we would acknowledge, I think, just to kind of cover that as a broader topic, the authentication nuances are a maturing area for Tableau and Azure, for sure. Yes, sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would put that under the category of market demand. Um, but that is, the process of that is well underway. Okay, good question. So the question was around containerizing Tableau Server. Uh, like I said, the process is well underway. How um, portable that is in the clouds, TBD, but right now it's definitely happening. Good question. Yes, sir. Yeah, we've, we've discussed it. Um, we haven't seen I would say it's a relatively recent increase in popularity, and so our response time to it isn't as fast as personally I would like it to be, um, but it's, it's, it's on the roadmap at an undetermined time, unfortunately, as with most <laughs> of the Azure developments. The oh. question was if there, my apologies, the question was if we're planning to uh, do connectivity to Azure Data Lake, correct? Um, Who is using Azure Data Lake that would like a connector for it? Okay. So I'm expecting that number to go up, and I think we need to be ahead of it. Um, but right now, as Chris has said, with a lot of this stuff that we're seeing with Azure, it's, we're kind of catching up to like, the speed at which Azure is uh, growing and mm -hmm. becoming popular, I would say. We, and, and that's true, and there's a contextual perspective to take on that. Um, when you look at the, the big three, public clouds, AWS, Azure, Google, we realize they all come to the cloud from a different place and are converging there around a lot of similar services, right? AWS, classically, they have their retail store. They, they figure out how to uh, monetize their excess, and here we are, we have AWS. Uh, Google, same thing. They have a worldwide network of email, YouTube, and they say, hey, rent our space. We're, and they're coming at us with technology and services and this and that. Microsoft is the only one of those three that already has software assets in almost every customer they're going to talk to. And they're going to approach the cloud by protecting those assets, thus the security focus. Thus, the, we're going to protect our assets and, and add incrementally to the services we need based on market demand. So there's a little different take with Azure there, just for some perspective. 
Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, it depends on the scenario, but that's a good observation, right? I mean, we want to be smart about where we place our consumption and where our data is. I think with the speed of the networking in the public cloud in general, they should see reasonably similar results. Now that said, I don't know. We'd have to try the actual use case. But I think uh, to, the, to the striping discussion, the, the, the networking in the cloud is super fast. It's super fast, and it's starting to neutralize some of the classic concerns. And it's case by case, right? We want to test it out. Good questions, guys. This is great. Yes, sir. No. Yes. Well, we do have, we do have hot topology with our nodes now, OK? And that, that's more mature than it has been in the past. Yeah, yeah. We've kind of transitioned away from the primary and worker model um, because now with TSM uh, and like the coordinate, cluster coordination service, that service is intended um, to be highly available. So you're not, that, and that's so designed to eliminate that single point of failure. Yeah, that, uh, it's sometimes still referred to as that, but you can configure it with a, a distributed coordination service so that you don't have that problem. I want to continue questions. As those of you who have had your fill or want to leave, that's good. But please uh, complete the survey and uh, let us know if we can do some things better. We know that we are merging into Azure and everything's developing. I mean, we were working on our white paper and we're waiting for the publishing and waiting for the publishing. And then I see the architecture page on Microsoft change. And we're like, wait, wait, double check. The good news is we went down the right paths. So we already had it essentially. But just, you know, there's, there's always changes. So we want to keep current with you and we want to keep connected with you. Um, not ending Q&A. Just want to ask you to fill out the uh, survey. Any other questions, guys? Really good questions coming up. Good, thank you. You're dismissed. Anyone who has a question, please come up and talk to us. Thank you for taking the time to come today, and thank you for enjoying this time with us. Stay connected. Help us succeed together in Azure. Take care now.